welcome everyone. And uh, as you can see from our PowerPoint here, this is my name. I'm Dr. Guthrie. I'm professor in the computer science department and former dean and chairman of that department, currently a dean at the university. And my wife, Elaine, who you also see here, Elaine Guthrie, who's our director of enrollment and overall program director for this computer science program. As you know, then you were connecting with, with interest in the computer science department at Maharshi International University, Fairfield, Iowa. And we're from the Masters in Computer Science program. So what we'll talk about today is the program, which we call the, generally the Computer Professionals Program. And we'll explain why it is that that title is the right title. It's not just an academic program or a research oriented program, but it's oriented toward professionals, people that wanna have practical applied knowledge in the field. What we'll talk about briefly is the technical job market. And that's because our program directly interfaces and links up to professional training in the job market. So it's important that people come with that goal and with that intention and to see what's going on here. The second will be something about creativity in education. We'll talk about what we have uniquely in that area. And the basic idea is very simple. It's that technical success is more than technical details. It's more than technical knowledge. It's it's you, it's your ability to be balanced and creative and expanding at all times in the job. And then from that, we'll see how those things come together in our Masters of Science in Computer Science program, our so-called COMPRO program. We'll talk about the format, the academics, the structure of the program, graduation requirements, coursework, all of those things. And from that, we'll look at how finances work for the program. Finances are not an academic area, but they're important because that's how you get into an academic area, okay? And then we'll uh, end up talking about some of the details of actually applying for the program and the program requirements. And then we'll take questions and answers. So we'll try and keep this general first presentation part moderately short. Uh, let's take a, a quick survey of, of people's backgrounds coming to this webinar. So there's a little poll online here. So I'll launch a poll. And what you should be able to see are four questions here in the poll. So if you can answer those. Now, if you're on a phone or something portable, maybe it's not so easy to answer them. But uh, if you're on a computer or something where you can click, there are four questions here. So if you just take a moment and go through and click on those, uh, we'll get some feel for who we're talking to and where to spend the most time in, in both discussions and questions and answers, okay? So we'll just take a moment to do that, so. Fifteen out of twenty-four have voted. Or <laughs> answered rather. Good. Wait till we get to eighty-five percent. We're at seventy-five percent now. Well, this is 19, uh, one more, well, we got 20. Okay, good, we're looking pretty good here. So let me uh, save that. So I don't know if you can see the results here, but 86% uh, say they're already familiar with our programs and about half have already applied to the program, which means you're, you're, you're very familiar with it and the details, but may have some questions, uh, which I hope we can answer then for you today. And then the third one says, if yes, if you have already applied, do you already have a visa? Uh, and of that five, yes, 16, no. So one third, yes, already have a visa. And have you already watched the longer program overview online? And in, in the mailings on Facebook, I think it mentioned that there's a longer version, something similar to what we'll do today, but this is about one third of it. 
So it goes into a little more detail. Okay, so good. That gives some good feeling for us of, of where you are at. And how do I get out of polling there? Good. So let's continue then. And what we'll look at next is something about our university because we are a small university, but but we've had a large impact really with over 2000 graduates since the program started in just this program. And we are now actually either the or one of the largest master's programs in this area in the US. But because we don't have a big football team and don't have tens of thousands of students, it's good to introduce a little bit about our background of the university. It was founded by Maharshi Mahesh Yogi in 1973 in the US. And the idea was to add the missing element of consciousness to modern education. That word may or may not be so familiar to you, but consciousness means the idea of your own intelligence. And it means that you are not just aware of what you're studying, computer science, physics, math, whatever the details of some discipline are, but you also have good increasing growing knowledge and strength and familiarity with yourself, with your own inner intelligence. After all, it's that intelligence which is learning these things on the outside. It's like a, a computer and the data, you know, the data is nothing without the computer. So you are the computer and we have to maximize your value at the same time we maximize the value of all the curriculum and everything else that you're going to study. And so it was founded by Maharshi, who was at that time teaching a, a meditation technique. And this meditation technique then was well known and researched, but actually the most researched technique of any around of any psychological technique around the world. And it was shown to have such good effects on people in terms of balance and health and physiology and mind and body and everything. The idea was that's what a university should do. A university should not just be book learning and details, a university should be the universe. The universe includes you and what you're studying. And the goals of education then should include more knowledge, more details, in our case, knowledge of computer science and all those fields involved with it. And also more success. The reason that you come to study is, well, it's, of course, it's enjoyable to learn more, but you want to learn more so that you can have more success in all areas of life. And from that to have more happiness. Why, why do we do everything? We do anything because we want to grow and be and give more. So the goal of an education should be a better life, not just technical book learning. And so we'll comment a little bit later um, about how we achieve that in our program that we do have a scientific way. We're after all computer science. It's a part like math and physics and engineering. We should have some science and some data, not just some idea of, oh, this is a good thing. Well, to say a little bit about the job market and technology, as we all know, technology is the future and, and software and software development is the basis. So I'll say a couple things about the job and technology market and directions in the US. And then I'll make a couple of other quick comments about how that's changed recently in the last six to eight months with this global pandemic, and what our outlook is from that, because we have to be practical and take that into consideration as well. And in general, the idea is that technology is always growing. And if we look at this, it says a 12% growth in technical employment in the US by 2024. That's a, that's a big area. It's almost twice every other business industrial area in the US and almost a half a million new technology jobs in the US. Half a million new jobs is a lot, but law of supply and demand, but how many people are competing for those jobs and the data says that there are almost 10 times more jobs open than there are students graduating in computer science. And the data is a couple of years old because it takes a while to collect it from government statistics. But here you see every year computer science graduates and the majority of those are undergrad, not the more specialized master's degrees like ours. And currently open jobs over half a million. These are computing jobs, not all technology and engineering. So a factor of 10, so only one tenth as many people are there for the growing job market. And what are people looking for when they're hiring in this job market? Well, of course, they're looking for technical skills, a resume, classes, coursework, experience, and so on. 
But the hardest things employers indicate are so-called soft skills. So, what does that mean? Soft skill. Soft means it means us. <laughs> We're considered soft compared to computers and wires and electronics and all of that. So hard skills, yeah, the details of what your resume says, what your your degree says, what your transcript says. Yes, those are definitely important and required. But the hardest skills to find by employers are these so-called soft skills. So you do need a strong academic background. And our program is based on an undergraduate degree or equivalent technical background and experience. But in addition to that, an advanced degree like ours, a master's degree gives you more specialized, more advanced knowledge and that gives you greater opportunities and advancement. And the third thing then is the ability to somehow increase your personal quality yourself. They don't want to just know what you've done. Otherwise, they just read your paper. They wouldn't interview you. They wouldn't call you in, fly you across the country. Although these days we do it all online. Creativity, balance, and intelligence. So, so how can we do that? And you can think of it that really our brain. Our brain is like our, I'm losing my arm. Our brain is like our CPU. Our CPU is what we do to compute everything we do controls our body, controls our hardware, controls our thinking, our emotions, everything. So how can we improve it since that's the basis of, of everything we do? And the answer is that everything we do is based on that. So we could talk about just somehow being able to optimize that. Well, we could look at the opposite of that in mathematics. Sometimes you prove things by negation. Stress and fatigue we know are bad. The brain loses clarity and thus capability. So if we're tired and we're dull. We can't think clearly. And in fact, if we're tired and dull, the body gets sick. So what's the first prescription if you're, if you're ill? Rest, rest. And then the body, everything takes care of itself. Everything optimizes itself. So the doctor will always tell you, oh, if you're sick, go to bed, get some rest. So getting more rest automatically and automatically is the important word here. It, it relieves any problems and stress and dullness in the body and in the brain. And this then provides increased health, creativity, and intelligence. So a simple recipe for being more creative and more successful is be on a good schedule, get good rest. And optimization of the brain, what we do is we take that same approach and we use what's called the Transcendental Meditation Program. And this I mentioned earlier, Maharshi, Mahesh Yogi, who had founded the university, had been teaching this around the world. And what happens is during this technique, people get more deeper, profound quality of rest and sleep. The body actually settles down to a more quiet, settled level of oxygen consumption, EEG, all of the indicators. So rest, we rest during the night, we get so much rest, it's better. So much rest is better. This technique gives twice as much rest to the mind and body, and therefore correspondingly a greater amount. So more purification from mind and body. It's, it's a very traditional kind of sounding name, Transcendental Meditation Program. Maybe if we called it Brain Optimization Number 23, it would sound more modern, but we, we've stayed with the traditional way of describing it. And like sleep, it's simple and natural. It's automatic. It's not a belief or a study or something we think about. It's automatic. And the result then is well-documented. We get more mental clarity, more creativity. And this is well-documented by over 600 different research studies. It's simple and universal. And just to show one of those studies, it shows that when we measure what's going on in the brain, so here's some brain measurement points. This technique is commonly used. It's called alpha coherence. So alpha is a certain wave bandwidth. And these are brain measurements, measuring EEG on the scalp top of the scalp, front of the scalp. And it shows that different areas of the brain do different things. Here, these areas of the brain are working together to do something, maybe solving a problem. These might be working for vision, rear areas of the brain are for physical control and body and senses. And the front part of the brain is for what's called the CEO of the brain, the coordination, what's going on overall, and putting everything that happens in the other areas together. So there's not too much going on. Now, if we just close our eyes, what we have to see is we see more coordination, more things going on, especially in the front, but in all areas of the brain as well. In the rear areas, you can see they're more coordinated because the body's not doing anything. Their eyes are closed. And then when we begin this TM technique, look what happens. 
just look, it's an amazing thing. It's something that has perhaps never happened in your brain before. Never happened in your brain before. All of these different areas working together. So what do we see? We see that from our normal activities, and we're probably very smart, you're all, generally all of our applicants, we screen for very high achievement academically and professionally. So you're already smart. And then look what happens. Your brain is like a CPU with the clock rate sped up. And what happens from that is intelligence changes. Intelligence changes. And intelligence is always thought to be, we can measure it, IQ test. You're smart or you're not, good luck. But what happened with a four year longitudinal study at a university was that students who practiced TM, their intelligence went up, their IQ, you, you probably know that term IQ. This has never been seen before because IQ is supposed to be, it's just what you are. You're tall, you're short, you're smart, you're not. But no, it's not true. IQ can be increased. So however smart you are, however successful you are, however creative you are, you can be more. You can have more, you can do more. And this is the way to do it. Gain that deeper quality of settled, balanced state of rest, then automatically your system optimizes for it. So this is what we have in our program. And we call it the Compro Computers Professional Program, as I mentioned. And this is then what we'll describe the details of. And you can go online and you can look at all the details on the online website if you haven't already. It looked like over half had already. So I'll leave that to you to do any further research necessary. It's a global program. We have interest from all around the world and why you'll see in a, in a few minutes how the finances and the structure of the program and the professional aspect to work at a high tech job in the US are very attractive for all around the world. Now, right now, it's hard to get from all around the world into the US. Certain embassies are closed, transportation's harder. We do have students coming in. We just admitted a class of about 52 students from all around the world. Normally our classes are larger than that, 100 from all around the world. And Elaine will talk a little bit more about that. But things are starting to open up. Uh, we're still in the midst of this. So we're, we're thinking that probably full back to operation of the program will be probably next spring. What's the structure of the program? Well, it's a unique combination of these three things, the creativity and intelligence that I mentioned already, advanced graduate study, that's our academic component and professional work experience. And we put them together by combining on-campus study, off-campus work practicum and using distance education to connect the two. And this combination of work and study allows for very easy initial finances. And so I'll, I'll describe that if you're not familiar. That is, what does it cost to start the program and then what does it cost to end the program and make it all the way through, okay? Well, the program begins with full-time on-campus study, about eight months, six, seven courses on campus. And then students leave campus and they go all around the US to work in different companies. And they complete their coursework through distance education while working in an advanced IT position. The same curriculum is used there as what we have on campus. And in fact, we have videotaped and recorded and augmented with online materials, the actual on-campus courses. So what's the structure of it? Well, you're probably no doubt familiar with the semester system, which is what almost all colleges use. There's several in the US that don't, that are more like us. But the semester is when you take maybe five courses, first semester, five courses, second semester. Here's 10 courses. That's typically what you'd need for one year a one and a half year graduate program in the US. So the first major thing we've changed is we use what's called the block system. We only study one course at a time. So instead of studying algorithms and then operating systems and then whatever else, math, database, going one to one to one and all of your exams and projects do here at the end, you do one course and then all of your final presentations, your groups, your interactions, your grades, your your exams are all done there. Next course, next course. It lets you sequence many courses. If you wanted four courses in a row for big data or for data mining, can't do it here because you haven't finished the first one and the second one. Here, one, two, three, four, you can sequence easily. So that's the first major thing that we do. And this allows for you to have complete focus on each course. You don't go an hour today and an hour and Wednesday and an hour Friday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, one hour. That's not a real world scenario and it's not the way you would work when you get out of here. 
So we start with full time, however, on campus. So uh, in the, I mentioned here that the, a degree would consist of approximately 10 courses, one structure, our structure. But instead of doing the whole thing on campus, although we do have an option to do that, you take part of it on campus. So you start with six courses or about eight months full time on campus. And then because it's modular, because of this block system, then what happens is now you can take what you've learned so far plus your experience and you can go out and you can get a job. And we work with you and Elaine will say a little bit about that. We have a whole team and a department that helps you find a job. And when you find that job then, then you continue and you work full time in that job. It's called CPT, Curricular Practical Training. The C curricular means it's part of your academic degree. And DE then is the distance education. So your activity of study, working full-time during the day and then studying in the evenings and weekend. This becomes part-time. Now, what was one full-time course in a month becomes four months part-time. Four courses at four months each is about 16 months. Eight plus 16 is about 24. So the whole program can take 30 to 31 months to finish. So it used to be that this would be a program like this, maybe a one or one and a half year program, all academics, but no, We've mingled and mixed with it the practicum, integrated that. And so what you have then is you have both of them. You have full-time on campus, part-time DE, and full-time practicum work somewhere at a job in the US. Well, what does the structure look like then? Well, this allows several things. The first is normally when you would start a program, you have to pay. So you'd have to pay here. And programs in the U.S. are fairly expensive. They might be forty to sixty to eighty thousand dollars, and then you would complete the whole ten months, not six months, and then you'd get your degree. That's a lot of money. That's a lot. That's a challenge for anyone, especially international, to be able to come and pay that amount of money. So what we've done is we've cut the program in half. So this first six months on campus, you pay a slow initial payment. And that's typically four to $8,000, depending on the country and your background and your application. And then, as I said before, you go out and you start with a job practicum. And when you get your job practicum, we have an arrangement with the local bank and the local bank then will give you an educational loan to pay off all of your educational expenses. And then you can pay that back while you're working in this job practicum. And you have a high salary during the job practicum. Our average salaries are ninety-two dollars to $100,000 US. That converted into your local currency, that's a lot of money. And so that says that you really earn enough money here to pay back your educational loan that you had from the local bank and then have other money left as well, okay? So it's a feedback loop. So what you pay in the beginning doesn't even cover this first time on campus. So we subsidize and support that. And then you get you pay off the whole thing when you start your job practicum. Uh, what's the job market like in the US? Well, even with COVID, uh, we're getting a lot of job placements and the technical industry is always one of the least impacted and the earliest to recover. And that's what we're seeing now. Our students are going out and getting jobs. Uh, over the last 20 years of the program, we've had a 99% placement rate. So why? that's why we can afford to make this investment in you because we know that you will be successful. And that's part of what we screen for when we're accepting people. So the result then at the end is you've completed your MS degree with all the academics. You have substantial US work experience a year and a half to two years. And you have the ability to pay off your program fees with good savings depending on how much you make, where you decide to live in the country, and all those different factors, which we take into account in setting up your financial arrangements. That's what's unique about it. Uh, our courses, it's a graduate program. You can look online and you can see all the standard uh, courses are here. Uh, we have specializations in these. Uh, we have specialization in web programming, specialization in big data and big data analysis. Uh, standard courses in algorithms, database, networks, uh, traditional graduate level courses. So we have some specializations and some regular uh, courses that you would expect. Our students work all throughout the U.S., including top IT companies. And I think we've had over a thousand different companies in the U.S. hire our students as of now. So that's a, a brief overview of the program. 
of what's unique about it. And just to summarize what's unique is the block system. It's the integration of this mental development of yourself while you're studying. It's the professional job placement. So you have that professional experience as a part of your academic program and degree and the finances of it. It lets basically the program be self-financing other than a small initial startup cost. Uh, I'm gonna pass it over to Elaine now to go ahead and give a little bit more details on what it takes to go ahead and apply and enter into the program. Uh, Elaine, do you wanna to switch to your computer or you want me to click through them for you as you go? Uh, I think it's fine if you just leave that up. Can, uh, are people able to hear me? <laughs> One person is, good. <laughs> okay, I assume that others can as well. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. So, hi everybody. Um, I would like to just go over the entry requirements for the program and then the admission steps uh, for the program and then a couple of quotes from some of, a couple of our students. And uh, then we can take questions and answers. We've been answering a few of them. Greg, just so you know, I've been answering the question and up to three questions below. <laughs> we can answer them now or afterwards. But So of course you need to have a bachelor's, a four year bachelor's degree in computer science or some related field from an accredited college or university. Um, you should have a good uh, grade point average or percentage uh, from your computer science degree as well as in particularly in the programming classes that you've taken. So, you know, programming one, data structures, programming, software, so Java programming, software engineering, those courses we'd like to see some nice grades. Uh, looking at for the B grade, which is kind of average grade. Um, English, of course, you need to be able to, to speak and understand English, uh, say the intermediate level, just enough that you can, you know, so you can communicate fairly well, fairly smoothly back and forth. Um, we also like to see that you've had some professional programming work experience. Uh, that's what we're looking for for our acceptance. Uh, at least six months. It's nice if there's uh, even more, one to two years of professional work experience. We will accept some applicants that don't have any work experience or very little, as long as they've done very well, they have high grades in their bachelor's degree and their English is, is uh, good. Uh, next. Greg? Thank you. Okay, so the admissions process, pretty simple. You go to our website, compro.miu.edu. Um, there's an online application, a link to it right in the top right-hand corner. Uh, very fast, take you 10 minutes maximum to fill out that application. Just the minimal we need to know that you pass through what we call phase one uh, acceptance to the program. The very next step will be to take a two hour online programming test. So you'll be given a link to take the programming test. You take it when you want um, and you'll get the results back within a day or two usually. Uh, it's very fast to get the results back. <clears throat> if you pass the test, you'll go on to the next steps. Uh, if you don't pass the test, you'll be allowed to try the test again. Um, but if you fail it twice, then you'll be asked to take some more courses or do some more, have some more work experience, something like that. Um, so once you pass the test, then you'll be asked to send a copy of your transcripts and uh, resume. Uh, there's a personal information form where you write a couple of essays. And then you will have an English interview with one of the admissions representatives um, via Skype so that they can see you and talk to you. And again, we're not looking for perfect English, just that you know, it's easy enough to communicate back and forth. After that, you'll be asked to send your bank statement showing that you have the money. Um, and then there's a $50 application fee that you do not pay until you basically know that you're accepted to the program. 
So you can go through the whole application process without having to pay anything. And then you find out if you are accepted to the program or not. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, so the finances of the program, the total program cost for tuition, room and board and student fees is now about $43,000. The initial payment to be made when you come on campus is usually between $3,000 and $5,000. That includes all your room and board expenses for uh, up to the eight months or even actually up to even 10 months. So you do not need to pay anything more than this initial payment until you go out and start your curricular practical training position. Um, so again, your tuition, your room, your food for you know, eight to 10 months on campus is covered. You don't have to try and find a place for yourself off campus. Uh, but we do ask also that you have a, an additional $2,000 for personal expenses. You may want to buy a computer. Sometimes there's some health uh, expenses or just, you know, personal supplies and things. So you will need to verify an additional $2,000 that you have. Again, so the remaining program costs are paid through a bank loan from a bank that we have already made this arrangement for in our town after you start your CPT uh, working position, okay? So uh, just a couple of quotes here. Uh, Adriano uh, from Brazil, he said, uh, this is where he's working at Kite String Technical Services. The financial aid is definitely what I've liked most about the Compro program. It is great to be able to afford a master's degree in the US, spending a small amount of upfront and having the rest of the costs rolled into a loan that you start paying after getting the internship. Next. Kong Pham from Vietnam, he's working at eBay right now. And actually just to back up a little bit, we have, we have four entries a year, and typically there's about, and no, oh, can go go back, Greg, go back. I just wanted to mention that we have about 29 students, 29 countries represented every entry. So typically on campus, we'll have 50, 60, 70 different countries represented. Uh, we have quite a few students come from Vietnam. Uh, this fellow has recently been working for eBay. You can tell he's got his mask pulled down <laughs> below his face. Uh, so it was during the COVID time. So he says that in just than, less than a year, I got a job that I wouldn't dare to dream of, working for eBay as a software engineer. The Compro program itself is one of a kind. It gives you a once in a lifetime opportunity to become a high skill engineer in the US with a decent salary. Ask yourself, do you want to boost up your resume? Do you want to experience US culture or visit the world famous Yosemite Park? This is your chance. Whoever you are, come join me, I'm waiting. Okay, next. So in conclusion, uh, we have a very unique program on many levels. We teach on the block system. We offer the academic degree plus professional work experience working in the United States, any state in the United States. Um, easy entry finances, which you uh, won't, I don't think, find at any other university unless you're offered a TA position. Um, the whole program is self-financing through your placement, your CPT placement. Uh, and then, of course, we have this additional of growth of creativity and intelligence through the practice of transcendental meditation um, that all of our students, faculty and staff, we all practice transcendental meditation. So we, with the unique, unique system, we have unique results of uh, gaining very great uh, knowledge in the IT programming area plus ex wonderful experience in the uh, US job market. Uh, you have self growth and finances for yourself. Greg? 
Okay. Here's a picture of some of our every once a year we have graduation on campus and our students, these students have been all out in the United States working all around the US. Uh, they're coming back to enjoy graduation. Uh, see some of our faculty sitting uh, in the front row there. Okay. Uh, yes, just a couple of slides of around the campus. This is our, our Jiro Student Center. The dining hall for the students is there. The big lecture hall, student cafe, student lounge, bookstore, things like that. Next. So that's, that's the final uh, slide. Um, there's our website for where you can apply. Um, you can also ask questions there if you for contact uh, admissions office. So now uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. I can see there's been quite a few and I assume Greg's been answering those questions. Um, but so, let, so let me, I don't think uh, everyone can see the questions. I think they are, I'm not really sure how it works. Uh, we've answered a bunch of them, but uh, have people seen the typed answers to other questions or I don't know what answer live means here. So maybe we'll just read through and answer a couple of them uh, here. So one of them says, I'm a technologist, can I apply? Uh, and so someone says, no, they can't see the answers. Uh, so um, so this, this question, can I apply as a technologist? The answer is it depends what you mean by I'm a technologist, that if what you mean is that uh, you have a degree in, in something uh, other than computer science or you're working in some area, then it would just depend on evaluating carefully, do you have the equivalent of an undergraduate degree in computer science? And Elaine and her admissions people can help uh, help you do that. Uh, if that's the most uh, important, the most important thing is just you know that you're a programmer. I mean, the second step you saw was uh, taking a program test, and so you're going to be able to need to program in C, C plus plus, C sharp, or Java. You need need to know one of those languages. Um, so, but, and, but, just, but just to clarify, it's not just a programmer. Oh, I read a book and I know how to program in Python, or I did this and that. It's the equivalent of what you would have if you had been working as a software developer and or have a degree in computer science. So you know what data structures are, databases, networking, uh, programming languages. There's so many different things. So, you know, there can be a variety of ways people get it. Someone just mentioned uh, uh, they have, um, some people have computer applications, some have MIS-like degrees. The simplest thing is if you actually have a computer science degree from a university with the word computer science on it. If you don't, then you work with the admissions department to evaluate that you do have that equivalent knowledge. This is not a conversion degree. You know, gee, I majored in art, but computers sound really interesting. I think I want to convert over and work for Microsoft. No, this is a degree where you have computer science knowledge and background and you want to move to a higher level, a different level. Uh, so the details, if you don't have, have all of that would be something you'd work out with the, uh, the department. Elaine, were you going to comment or add to that? No, I was just going to go to the next question of, in case you don't need financial aid, can I pay the fees directly to the university? Yes, of course, we're happy to have you <laughs> pay directly to the university. We do have uh, different ways that you can do that. So that's um, that's no problem at all. Um, yeah, Basic, basically what we have is for people that don't have the ability to self-finance and pay tuition, which is what you'd have to do at most universities being an international student coming to the US, we have a special, this special arrangement with this local bank where you can get an educational loan that you wouldn't have been able to get otherwise because we are a university. So it's to simplify it. So you're not required to do that if you can get your own financing, but. Okay. Yes, uh, and the, the installments, uh, 
I don't remember the details of that, but there is an installment uh, plan that once you get to that, you would of course be required to pay at least the minimum when you first come, whatever that is, 3,000, 5,000. And then when you get a job, if you didn't wanna take out the bank loan, there is an installment uh, plan that uh, the Career Center sets up with you. And, and I'm not totally familiar with those details. Well, the basic idea is that they would take how much money you've borrowed from the bank to pay off your, your student loan. And then they divide it up by the months that you'll be working. And they look at how much money you're making, what your finances are. Some people live in New York City or California where it's much more expensive. Others live in the Midwest. So depending on where you're living, what the cost of living is, how much you're making, they work out some formula. Uh, there's examples of this online on the finances page uh, and they can give some idea of it. But it's different, a little different for each person because people have different incomes, different living styles, different living places and so on. So the, the payments are, are based on that. But there are some samples online you can look at. So the next question uh, about having already passed through all the whole application, um, not, but the visa, the embassies aren't open. All we can do is wait. We have a lot of people um, in different countries. Luckily, many embassies are open, but that's all we can do is wait. And you, your application is good uh, for at least a year. So just uh, sometimes the embassies will take uh, emergency appointments at that point, but I can understand it may take a while for Brazil. Yeah, but also, I mean, we, uh, we just had an election yesterday in the US. We're thinking that we're, looks like we're gonna have a new president who's much more favorable to immigration and support of other countries. So we're hoping that by the end of this year and early next year, this whole thing will turn around. Do you provide medical insurance? Yes, that's a part of, it, it, it's all provided. So this initial payment that you make supports you on campus, living, food, dorm, insurance, fees, everything uh, for that first six to eight months on campus. We do, uh, just to clarify that, the, for the first eight months, it's, it's included in your program cost. After that, if you know you, if you get a job from a company, you take insurance from the company, that's fine. Or if you stay with our insurance, then you have to start paying for it after the eight months. But the first eight months is included in the program cost. Um, can someone come with his wife and his child stay off campus? It, both wife and child would have to, <laughs> and you maybe would have to stay off campus. Yes, we don't have family housing um, as part of the program or, or have something close to campus, but um, yes, you would have to be able to pay for that yourself and it's not part of the program cost. That would be additional cost to bring. So the in. answer is yes, you would stay off campus. Your family would stay off campus and we would then not charge you for the room and board is included in all the costs that Elaine had given. Room and board for a student single student to live on campus. Since you wouldn't be doing that, that would come out of your costs and instead you would have to support your family living off campus. So you would need to have some additional finances planned for that. Okay, My, next question is about the embassy. Someone got an appointment um, January 18th. Is it enough time to get the visa or not? It kind of depends on you and the embassy really. The, the, the February entry actually begins, I believe it's like January 29th or something like that, uh, that you have to be in the US. Actually, we'll probably be earlier, January 25th, because we have everyone isolate for two weeks when they come on campus. So if you can get a visa and get on a plane, <laughs> stop your work, everything else you need to do, otherwise, you can get a visa and then you could po postpone to the May entry if it was just not quite enough time. Um, explain the process of applying for an alternative loan with a cosigner to pay the initial amount. You would have to know someone in the United States um, who is a US, I think, 
citizen, I'm not sure if it could even be a resident, but a citizen um, who can co-sign the loan with you. Uh, and that's between you and them. We do not help you with that. We don't, that, that initial payment is yours to figure out. But, uh, well, it, it, kind of, it kind of depends, Elaine, on what they're saying here is, if they're going to get a loan from a bank, not our bank, but some other bank, uh, <laughs> with someone that they know, a friend or a relative in the U.S., and that person in the U.S. is going to be the co-signer, then that's completely their arrangement that they make with their supporter and with the bank. And in the end, all that happens is that their bank pays off the university for your program costs, and then you are repaying back to that bank that you made that loan arrangement with. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a little more complicated than that. You wouldn't have to pay pay M MIU before you get your visa. Some people do because they think it'll help with a visa. Um, but it, it, Brazil, we have not had any trouble with students getting visas. The other way we do it is we have to see a bank statement from the sponsor and that they also sign an affidavit of support that they will be supporting you. So that's from our admission side, what we require um, if, you know, you don't have to pay the university before you get the visa. Um. <laughs> so yes, I have. Uh, the answer is good. Uh, <laughs> the next one, I don't know if, if can, can you guys see the questions that we're answering? Can you see a list of questions or not? I don't know. Uh, no. no, okay. So we'll, we'll keep going. No, someone says yes. Yes, they're able to see the questions. That, not the chat, but there's a list of questions and answers. Okay, so we'll keep rolling through these. It says there's 24 questions. Someone asks, what would happen if a student would not get a job after 10 months? Must the student pay the remaining cost without the internship? Uh, no. The answer is no, but it depends on details. Uh, if typically job placement times in the US have been two to four months with the pandemic now, it's slower. I think the average is around four months or maybe a little bit more for people getting jobs. I'd have to look it up three to four months. Uh, if students don't get a job after a certain amount of time, then the career center, the placement office is working with them. What's wrong? Is your resume written properly? Are you interviewing properly? Dot, dot, dot. And after some point in time, they may be required to come back on campus and take another course and get more support. Uh, if after a certain amount of time, and I don't know, it depends on the situation and the person, if it's 10 months or not, 10 months is a long time, uh, the, they would work with the career center to see what's wrong because it shouldn't, it shouldn't take that long. And like I said, we've been doing this for 20 years, even through an earlier recession in 2008, nine, and students do get jobs. So if after that long, you don't have a job, something's wrong. And what it is, uh, often, sometimes it's language. Students have come with very weak English, not typically not from Brazil, but maybe from other countries where language is much different than English. Uh, if you leave the program without finishing and without getting a job, you still would have the costs that you've had. You've taken a year of, of academic courses, uh, but if you leave the US and go home, because you couldn't get a job, then you don't need to pay that. If you come back to the US, th then you do need to pay that. So you can't go home and say, I couldn't get a job. And then six months later, the market looks good and you wanna come back and work for Microsoft. If you, when you come back to the US, then you do need to pay back that cost of that you've incurred for the program. Hope that makes sense. Uh, and Bachelor in computer applications with four year work experience. Uh, again, uh, what you would do is you would work with, I'd say the answer is probably yes, but uh, depends on the country and the university where you got the degree, you would work to document that on your application form with the uh, admissions department and Elaine's experts there, and they'd be able to tell you. It would depend on the work experience too. I mean, you would certainly qualify if you've been programming, you know, as working as a programmer, software developer, yeah. 
Uh, I'll do a couple more if you want, unless you want to jump in, Elaine. Uh, is this course indicated for someone who has extended experience already but wants to get master degree in business market? Yes, yes. But whatever experience you have already, there's always more. There's always more to learn. There's always more to do. There's always more to see. Uh, and so you would want someone that wants to expand their knowledge level and get this introduction and experience in the U.S. technical market. That's exactly what it's for. Elaine, you want to do? Yeah. So, so I get my final acceptance last month, but every U.S. embassy near me, basically in Iraq, is closed right now. What happened if I miss the February entry? <clears throat> Again, we just um, your your application is good for about a year, at least the tech, the programming test you took as the applicant part of the application process is good for a year. Of course, we keep your transcripts and everything that you've sent. So we just keep updating it. But the next entry after February is, is um, end of April, like April 29th, something like that. We call the May entry. Um, so we just keep, that's what we've been doing. Uh, students, we just kind of keep pushing them forward. At some point when all the embassies open, we're going to have a very large <laughs> entry. <laughs> um, what happens if my visa expired while I'm on CPT or OPT? Your visa is something that's really only relevant to leaving the United States and coming back in again. As long as when you, of course, when you enter the United States, your visa has to be good. In different countries are different lengths of time. Some countries are six months, sometimes are one year, sometimes they're five years they're good for. Um, let's say your visa is good for one year and you decide you want to go home again. You're gonna to have to go back to the embassy. If it's been after one year, you have to go back to the embassy um, to get a new visa in order to enter the US. If you never leave the US, as long as you're a student, uh, whether you're CPT or OPT, um, you're fine. You're, it doesn't matter if the visa expired, it's your I-20 that then is, is the most important thing, okay? Okay, so let's, I think we can do, uh, do some more of these kind of quickly here. Uh, next one says, can I come with my wife and child and stay off campus? Yes, I think we answered that. Next one says, I'm married, planning to live off campus with me and my wife. And, I will need medical insurance. I'm willing to pay installments directly to the university. I want to understand how much the tuition fees for my case. Uh, I'll leave that to you, Elaine. <laughs> I mean, there's the, the medical insurance, your medical insurance would be a part of, of all of your regular program fees. It's not broken out separately and individually. If you want uh, medical insurance in addition for your wife, then you would have to find some arrangement to do that. And, and I don't, that's not something we would do. And so- we, you, you can add it to the, the medical insurance that we have, but you have to pay for it. So, you know, it can go through our, our you know, our MIU, uh, it's mm. international insurance, but you will have to pay for it. Any more details that you need than that, you would need to email to me and um, or if you've already applied to your admissions rep and, and ask for those, how much the cost is and things like that. I don't know that. Okay, next one says, is there an MIU program that provides free scholarships for international students? And I would say this program is the closest you're gonna to get to it because it's a very low entry fee and you earn enough money while you're in it to pay for the degree. So it's a self-supporting, self-financing degree. Uh, if you're asking if there's a program where you don't pay anything, even though you're going to make, let's say $90,000 a year and you wanna keep it all but not pay for your degree, not this program. Mm -hmm. uh, the only that, scholarship the only scholarship we have is if you've taken the GRE and you get more than 90 percentile in the quantitative section, um, we give you a $1,000 uh, scholarship. But that's-, or, that's or fee, It's a fee reduction, yeah. Yeah. Okay, next one says, you said programming experience. It can be any language. You mean, can it be in any language like PHP, Python, React, dot, 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 or just in Java? Well, first of all, 
React isn't a programming language, and I don't know what USW is, but PHP and Python are not systems programming languages, so no. PHP is an embedded web language. It has to be in uh, a full-fledged system programming language. So yes, Java, C Sharp, C++ uh, are the ones that you need to have some experience in. Is there a minimum age limit to enroll in the program? Yes, it's five years old. You have to be <laughs> able to walk and talk and read and write your name. No, I'm <laughs> joking. No, no minimum or maximum age limit. Can you facilitate the process of getting the visa? Uh, the answer is yes and no. Uh, the no answer is that you have to get the visa. You have to go to the embassy. You get interviewed and so on. But uh, Elaine's experts in the placement office uh, have a lot of experience with this. And we have training on what to do to get a visa, the kinds of questions they asked, uh, what to say, what not to say, and so on. Now, I would point out that it's not that we're trying to train you to trick them with trick answers or something, you know, like an interview question. The, the main advice is going to be just be honest about your situation and your goals and so on. And then, because they, they interview thousands and thousands of people, and that's what they look for is someone that is serious about getting a degree in the U.S., and is qualified to get that degree academically and has the finances for it, and they're gonna come here to get it. Okay, next one says from NO, I'm really interested in the program, ready to take the risk, believing it's a step to fulfill me, although I have a master's in software engineering from University of Liverpool. This looks like a more practical, I just hope I make it through the admissions process and it pays in the end as explained, thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, it seems like you only, have a, a strong you know, background, master's in software engineering. Uh, yeah. Seems like so, you qualify and so that there's there's three there's three things that there's three people you have to convince to get accepted to the program. One is us, and the other is yourself, and the other one is the embassy to get a visa, and they're going to ask you if you already have a master's degree in computer science, why are you coming to the US to get another one? Are you just going to the US to get a job and work? And so you'll have to have, have looked at the degree and convince yourself that in fact, there are courses you haven't taken or specializations you don't have, or there's some reason that it's worth it to you to take an additional year of academic study to come here and get this additional degree. If your answer is just, gee, I wanna work in the US, then that's not very convincing to us or to the embassy. And in reality, you should be looking at just applying for a work visa. But there are, there are good answers to that question, but it's something that you should consider. It may be that we offer some courses you haven't had before, some specialization tracks, that there are application areas and companies in the US that you wanna to go to. So it, it's that kind of a question of what's the relationship of your current background and degree to enrolling in another master's program. Next one says, what kind of paper should I be ready with for the application process? Uh, don't know. Um, so you're, you'll need to be able to, you know, send, uh, have your official transcript sent from your university. Um, of course, to, just for the application process before you know if you're accepted, just a copy of your transcript, uh, of course your resume or CV Everything else is just documents that you send. So that, that's really the, probably the longest thing is getting your official transcript from the university. Can you do um, the FDR? I, I don't know what an FDR is. Uh, Financial so, data report or something. So we, for, for the bank statement, um, you, it can be from your bank account, it can be from your spouses, it can be from your family, your parents, your brother, it can be from just a sponsor, a friend that wants to sponsor you. But it has to have, you know, show that it's from a bank and what the current statement is and the, the embassies usually actually like to see at least the last six months uh, to see that you didn't just put in a whole bunch of money all at once. They want to really make sure that you um, you know, can afford this. So 
the bank statement can come from from anyone. And do you have scholarship offer? Yes, I've already I've already we, addressed yeah. that. That basically, yes, this program is self financing. So you give yourself a scholarship by working and making a high salary during the program. Elaine, a B one B two visa. Yeah, so that's a visitor's visa. No, you you can come to the U.S., but you would have to go back out again to get your F-1 uh, visa. We don't process, or you can try applying for it, but you wouldn't be able to start studying here um, until that came through. And it, it's much, much faster just to go to your home country uh, to get that visa. It could take up to a year to try and transfer to another visa, and there's no guarantee it'll get approved in the United States. So this same person that we talked about, FDR, has a couple of comments about their the details of their personal finances. And, and basically, yes, it seems like you'd be in good shape. Uh, if you wanted some specifics with your personal information, uh, email to Elaine and admissions. I, I don't want to mention those details online here. Uh, and they comment that they're from Bangladesh and have a strong experience in software engineering but that this would increase their knowledge and be a professional benefit for them. So that's all from the questions and answers. I haven't looked at the uh, chat yet. If there's any more questions there, let's uh, take a quick look. Uh, Seem to be similar, it's just the yeah. same thing. Same, same thing. Okay, good, good. Well, uh, so we're, we're, we're at one hour now, which was our goal to, to stay a little bit short. There is a, a, a longer version of this same information we just gave. It's online. I believe there should be a reference in the mail that you got. Otherwise, Craig Shaw, who does our recruiting, will send out some summary with the longer version of that. Uh, and you can always come back and uh, send emails to Elaine and her experts in the uh, admissions office. And she is the, the main organizing power and director of the program. We'll always make sure that you get it. Uh, you know, Greg, there's, that, there's one last question here, someone putting in just about getting a permanent job off, offer after the program. Um, it's up to the company. Once you start working for the company, it's up to them. If they want to sponsor you for the work visa, it's called an H-1B, or sometimes they do directly for a green card, which is uh, permanent residence uh, uh, status. So um, yes, many, many slash most of our students do go in that direction. Um, so it certainly is possible. There's one right before that, Elaine, about an F-2. Uh, I started to write have to. It really depends on the country. Uh, Jonathan, I think I know you. You've been waiting to come here. Is that right? For <laughs> for many months now. Um, I don't think there should be a problem. So with, the question with, uh, was, can we provide an F2 to the partner of some students when they're leaving the campus? Yeah, that's actually the ideal is that the the, you come here, you study full time, you're on campus, you focus, and then you go to get a job. And once you get a job, you apply for your wife to come um, and join you. Some countries prefer to, and they seem to have the money to be able to bring their, their wife or children, family with them. Then they, they just go to the embassy at the same time with their wife and hope that they both get a visa. But uh, again, there's never been a problem in Brazil getting visas, so that shouldn't be a problem getting the F2. So I think we'll close here, and uh, I, want, I want to thank all of you who've connected for your time and interest and attention. Uh, you know, these are really, really unusual times, but students are coming to our university. We've been very COVID safe. In the last few days, we've had some a couple of incidents on campus, which we hadn't had, I think, either none or almost none for the almost more than a half a year before that. We're in a small town, so we're not in a big city. There's not a lot of exposure uh, to it. Uh, so we're, we're hoping that this whole thing is going to age out between, you know, whether first, second quarter next year. 
whether you come immediately in first quarter next year or second quarter or whatever, third, fourth, fifth quarter, doesn't matter. Uh, it's a good direction for you to be considering to, as someone said, to raise their level of expertise and raise their level of experience. And the job market in the US amazingly is strong. You've probably seen that Amazon is hiring 100,000 new people, 100,000 new people. Now they're not all technical workers, but Microsoft, the big tech companies are doing well because everything's moving online. So the world is going to be a different world when this thing is over and preparing ourselves for that by greater experience, greater education, and even that greater intelligence in ourselves this transcendental meditation technique that you can learn at home before you come here. It strengthens mind, it strengthens body, it strengthens immunity from disease. These are the best ways to take care of yourself on every level for yourself, for your family, for your country, and even for the world. So we're always so happy to see people coming here. The success and prosperity and happiness of our students is from all around the world, as Elaine said, 70 different countries and some entries is a great thing. Uh, we're here, we're gonna be here <laughs> through the end of this year and starting next year. Uh, if you have anything we can do to help you with the process, you're connected to Elaine, who's the right person for anything you want. Okay, uh, Elaine, any parting words from you? No, just thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we're happy to talk to you. It looks like we've got quite a few different countries represented here. <laughs> At least we know Brazil and Bangladesh for sure. <laughs> but uh, we really hope, of course, we're hoping for every country to get over this pandemic as quickly as possible so we can get back to normal lives. And But either way, we hope that you will be able to join us uh, sometime in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you all and goodbye. And we'll hope to see you sometime either online or possibly even physically here in the U.S. Good day. And Thanks, goodbye. everyone. Bye-bye.